Good morning and welcome to Maple Grove United Church on Sunday, September the 27th. My name is Bruce Tanaka and I'll be, I'll be leading the worship this, this week. God, we are living in a world that is in deep need of your healing power. As we strive to be your hands and feet in a world which is staggering from hurt, pain, loss of life, loss of home, tiredness and weakness, we need you to hold us up when we have such little strength. You know more than anyone that our bodies look like right now at this moment. You know the pain we are going through personally the pain we feel for our neighbors around the world, the pain we feel for our family and friends who we cannot help. You know, God, what we are going through, and so we ask that as we do your work to show compassion, to reveal love, to help our neighbors, that you will also help us as we need to be filled with your peace, just as we reveal your peace to others. Amen. God, all of who wander in the wilderness, you go before us as, beacon, as a beacon and guide. Lead us through all danger, sustain us through all desolation, and bring us home to the land you have prepared for us. Amen. The opening hymn is Voices United, number 213, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
The Gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 27 and 28 to 32. Reading first, the authority of Jesus questioned. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. In verses 28 to 32, the parable of the two sons. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The next reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 2 to 9 and 12 and 13. Imitating Christ's humility. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or deceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And verses 12 and 13, shining as lights in the world. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of God for the people of God.
today's gospel reading from Matthew 21 is quite an interesting story, don't you think? In today's sermon, I will attempt to give the story some historical context and try to apply the story's lessons to our situation here at Maple Grove United Church at this juncture in our history. Chapter 21 of Matthew is a huge, sprawling piece, beginning with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, proceeding on to him cleansing the temple, cursing the fig tree, and ends with his being confronted by the Sanhedrin at the temple, and then telling some parables. In our reading today from verses 23 to 32, we see the chief priests and the elders of the temple confronting Jesus with a demand to tell them on whose authority is he doing what he does, and secondly, who gave him that authority? Jesus quickly turns the tables on them and asks them a question. He makes his response conditional on their giving him their answer first. His question is related to theirs, only more explicit. He asks them, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? He anticipates the binary nature of their question in that if he were to respond that his authority came from God, they would charge him with blasphemy. And if he were to respond that his authority came from man, they would say it was illegitimate. We are then privy to the temple leadership's thinking, where they too realize that they have been put in a bind. Much like the elites in today's world, they cannot accept John's legitimacy as it would undercut their own position, and yet they fear the populist backlash that would follow if they were to say John's authority derived from human origins. They responded with a non-answer, to which Jesus informed them that he too will choose not to answer their question. Jesus then goes on to tell several parables, the first of which Kathy read today about the two brothers. The parable frames the account of two questions by taking a longer perspective on, on the question. It includes the authority figure, the father, as well. Like most parables, this one is extremely sparse. Little is known of the situation that preceded the father's request or the presence of any extenuating circumstances for either of the sons. Jesus' question to the audience, again, we have to presume he's still in conversation with the chief priests and elders, but we don't know for sure, is, which of the two did the will of his father? The audience replies that the reluctant son who refused to do his father's request initially was the one who did the father's will. The question has changed since the authority is now known. Instead, the question becomes obedience to the authority. Jesus then declares that tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of the audience. Again, we assume that Jesus is in conversation with the temple authorities, but he could be addressing his lesson to a more general audience. If we skip ahead to the end of the chapter, Matthew writes, when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parable, they realized he was speaking about them. Since the initial confrontation was with the temple authorities, who were priests and elders, the audience must have swelled to include the Pharisees, who were most likely not part of the temple establishment, who were mostly Sadducees. Nevertheless, the parallels of the parables make a very unsavory impression on both groups by Matthew's account. After nearly 2,000 years of the telling of these stories, we feel Jesus was a clever debater who skillfully avoids entrapment for blasphemy, yet lets the authorities know how he feels about them. Having served on your church council for a number of years now, let me tell you that I have a certain amount of sympathy for the chief priests and elders. Let's put this reading into a bit of context. Shortly before this confrontation with the chief priests and elders, Jesus had just cleansed the temple in Matthew 21, chapter, uh, verses, verse 12. He overturned the money changers' tables and the seats of those who sold doves, accusing them of being thieves in the sacred space of the temple. Money changers, however, performed an essential service in the outer court of the Gentiles, where they would convert pilgrims' local currency into temple currency. Temple currency was required because most other currencies had graven images of kings or gods on them, 
which was forbidden by the Torah laws against idolatry. Similarly, the dove sellers provided an essential service because animals that were offered for sacrifice had to be without blemish. For pilgrims to bring their own animals from Galilee and beyond, only to be turned away for having non-conforming aspects would be both impractical, impractical and galling. These devotional requirements were not set by man, but were prescribed in Leviticus as some of the 613 mitzvot that observant Jews must obey. Now, over time, the temple leadership probably got wealthy from selling the concessions to the money changers and the animal merchants, but the rationale seems to be motivated by providing a needed service to the worshipping pilgrims to Jerusalem. The leadership group was doing what they had to keep the institution of the temple operating according to Jewish law as they understood it. The same can probably be said of the folks who donate their time to re represent you on the church council. We do the best we can. Recently, Harry criticized us for being unwelcoming because we locked up our crockery and silver in the kitchen. Hospitality was central to the early Christian community and few virtues would be more important than that of sharing food communally. 2,000 years on, things have changed, and our community rarely gathers for a meal together, and we would find it annoying that when all the silverware was missing when we went, decided to do so, but I digress. Jesus' presence in the story is one of an agent of change. We have already seen that the Sanhedrin, our leadership group, is likely livid that the business of the temple is being challenged by some itinerant teacher from Galilee. They have an interest in maintaining the status quo. The cleansing of the temple was seen as a challenge to the legitimacy of the temple authority and had to be stopped. Their livelihood depended on that. From Jesus' perspective, however, the status quo does not do the will of the Father. In Matthew 24, Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple to his disciples, where not one stone will be left here upon another. None of this is accidental. Matthew wrote between 80 and 90 CE, after Titus had conquered Jerusalem in 70 CE. Those of you who have been to Rome have probably passed the Arch of Titus near the Forum, which depicts the sacking of the temple by Roman troops. At the time of Matthew's writings, the temple-based religion of Judaism would have been in profound crisis. Existential cr questions about how the people of Israel were to interact with God in the absence of the temple are being developed. Matthew presents Jesus as the replacement for the temple where people can encounter God through Jesus. The status quo of our story is no longer an option. In light of this profound change to how people worshiped God, Matthew further develops the alternative to temple devotions in the parable of the two brothers. He does this by asking the question, who did the will of the Father? Our personal conduct is what is important. We must repent from our intern in initial disobedience from God and do his will. We are not supposed to present a faithful image publicly while being unfaithful to God's call in our hearts. Maple Grove United Church is also standing at the crossroads of change. After our first 65 years as a worshiping community, we too are stepping into an unknown future. We have had the past two years to think about the changes as we transition from a very stable neighborhood community to a smaller destination community of faith. We acknowledge the rapid societal changes brought about by the increasing secularism that sees one United Church congregation close every week of the year in Canada. When our, when our family transferred our membership here to Maple Grove in 1998, I was impressed with the programming at the church compared from where we had come from. There were large Sunday school classes, active youth groups, and a full sanctuary on most Sundays. I attended some extravagant gala fundraisers in the late 90s where the attendees looked like they had just decamped from the Granite Club. In the intervening 20 year, two years, the membership has slowly dwindled along with the programming. I personally observed this from 2009 to 2016, where I was involved as a confirmation class leader. 
The class shrank from over 20 grade nine students in 2009 to about four in 2016, one of which was actually a grade eight student. Since then, I think Andy has only confirmed a couple of people. Now Maggle Grove has this, the feel of our old church in Toronto just before they amalgamated with another church in North York. Unlike the demise of the Second Temple by siege, our decline has been slower and quieter. Nevertheless, it appears that like the post-70 CE period for Temple Judaism, the status quo at Maple Grove United Church is no longer an option. What happened? Who knows? We have come at this question in a number of ways, but try as we may, there seems to be no recursion to the past. We have always had We've had analyses done by two external consultants, the most recently by the EDGE folks. It seems we have sat on countless examinations and revisitings of goals and spiritual objectives, but never uncovered the secret to our past successes. When Harry announced that he was going to do this again, we all groaned in unison. And yet, this period in history seems to be desperately in need of the good news that Matthew writes about. Massive societal inequality, in the developed Western countries, millions of climate refugees moving around the globe, authoritarian strong men denying people their basic rights. Don't justice, compassion, and humility seem like good ideas right now? Today's gospel lesson gives us a good starting point. Matthew is advising us to discern what God is asking of us and to do his will. I think we have been doing that in some measure already. For example, you may have heard about our greening initiatives for our church property. The outreach committee looked at reducing our contribution to climate change by implementing some capital expenditures to reduce our carbon footprint. We are doing this to respond to climate injustice where we in the developed world contribute so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that the world's climate is rapidly changing. These changes result in larger and larger swaths of the globe becoming uninhabitable putting millions of people on the move to improve their chances of survival. Many of those folks contribute very little to the climate crisis, but are facing the horrible consequences of drought, famine, flooding, fires, and heat waves. All the while, we in the global north erect barriers to their movement and migration to preserve our currently unsustainable lifestyles. And this is just the beginning. This year, we are seeing the devastating consequences of our warming planet as we witness changing weather patterns that contribute to fires and floods, global pandemic, mass extinctions, along with mass migration of millions of people. No doubt, how we respond to this larger situation as a community of faith will be a critical part of our collective identity for the future. In spite of what I've just said, I want to close on a note of optimism for the future of Maple Grove United Church. I am optimistic for our future with our incoming minister, Carrie Stover, whom you will meet next week. Carrie has met with our worship and music committee, and I feel he'll be a good fit here. He is committed to seeking the truth of the gospel and finding God in our lives. I feel our journey with him will guide our discernment of God's will in these times of change. Amen, and so be it. God and community, hear us as we pray, as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends in Christ, God invites us to hold the needs of our sisters and brothers as dear to us as our own needs. Loving our neighbors as ourselves, we offer our thanksgivings and our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. Today, we lift up our concerns for others, O God of compassion. With confidence, we remember you before you the suffering of humanity and the brokenness of the world. Especially today, we pray for Donna and Russell Martin. Donna has been diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer with lesions observed on her liver and pancreas. We ask that you remember those in the community who are sick, sorrowful, lonely, and oppressed. 
Hear our prayers, God of power, and through the ministry of your Son, free us from the grip of the tomb, that we may desire you as the fullness of life and proclaim your saving deeds to all the world. Amen. The closing hymn will be taken from Voices United, number 651, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be, all, be with you all. Go now in peace. Now listen to the postlude.
Thank you.